Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. For giving. For giving. Thank you for your giving. To the Lottie Moon offering. Toward Lottie Moon. Thank you for giving to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. But most importantly, Due to your generosity, we've been able to share God's word with those around us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, First Baptist Church of Church in Riverside, California. Because you gave, I am able to access remote areas of Central Asia and explain the gospel with people God is already drawing to Himself. With your help, we are bringing light to the dark places among unreached people groups. Because of what you've given, it allows me to share this gospel with as many Central Asians as I can across London. Your giving allows our organization to provide need for refugees and to give them hope. Thank you for giving to the Lottie Moon Christmas Offering so that we can buy Bibles in Arabic that we use with our Discovery Bible Study with non-believers. Because of your generosity, African women are hearing stories from God's Word while henna is being drawn on their hands and arms. And because of your giving, the life changes that we see through faith in Jesus Christ, that happens because of your gifts. Thank you for giving to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering and helping to provide this wonderful water filter here in Northern Thailand. Your giving allows me to continue with my medical license here in Ghana where I can not only do surgeries, but also the patients have the opportunity to hear the gospel. So thank you. Because of your giving, I'm able to speak to these thousand kids every Wednesday morning. Thank you. Thank you, First thank Baptist, Baptist Church. Thank you, Faith Promise Church. Thank you, Faith Promise Church. Thank you, Faith Promise Church. Thank you for giving to Lati Moon. Thank you, and God bless you.
please turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. The title of today's message is Light and Life. Thank you for those joining us here this morning and those joining us online. I don't know if you've ever had the privilege of being able to go to Carlsbad Caverns in New Mexico. It's not too far from here, and it's a beautiful uh, place. Um, Carlsbad, it's, it's one of the larger um, caves and um, caverns that we have in the United States, and it is uh, worth going to. But uh, the entrance to Carlsbad is really unique. It, it has this sort of zigzaggy pathway that you go down and you just go down and down and down and you just descend into this uh, really unique, very interesting cave system. And you can actually go over um, a thousand feet underground and, you know, a thousand feet up isn't really that big of a deal. We've got planes that uh, go way higher than that, but to go a thousand feet underground is very unusual. It's a strange feeling. So you go down, down, down. You keep on descending. And, and you have these beautiful pathways that you go around. It's very easy to walk through. It's, it's lit up. It's got light and recess, light, and, 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 and it's, it's, it's beautiful to see and walk through. But I remember one particular place that we went to. They, they take you deep into this cave, and it's got lights, and, and, the, and the people have, uh, the, the rangers there have their, their lights and their flashlights on their, on their head. And, and then they they say, all right, everybody, you know, sit down, and we're going to turn out the lights. And they turn off the lights deep and dark in this cave, and there is no light shining through uh, whatsoever. It is a uh, palpable, it is a darkness that you can almost feel. You can't see your, your hands in front of your eyes. It's incredible how incredibly dark it is down there in this cave. And then the ranger will strike a match. It's incredible how this tiny, uh, seemingly insignificant amount of light brightens up the cavern. And it seems like you can see all around. And it's a cool experience. I'd recommend it sometime. In a much more um, serious and important way, God says that there is a darkness in our world. There is darkness in our country. There is darkness even in our own hearts. But the darker that pitch black uh, moral darkness is, the easy it is for our lights to shine and for us to point us to um, the true light. See, we live in a dark and darkening world, and there is but one cure for that darkness. See, Christ is our hope for the darkness in our hearts and in our world. So if you would read along with me in John chapter 1, we'll look at verses 1 through 5 this morning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, the W being capitalized here because the Word is re referencing Jesus Christ. So the Word was with God. Jesus was with God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time. Lord, I thank you for this time of worship. Lord, I thank you for the choir that led us so well this morning into worshiping your presence and so father i pray that you will speak to us now through your word Lord, i pray that you would um, just show us the, the necessity of a, of a world that is um, dark and the way that we can be light in it and so father i pray that you'll speak through me this morning and i ask these things in jesus name amen so point number one we see the light entered the darkness we see this in the earlier parts of verse 5. The light entered the 
darkness. Now, the first uh, four verses, you could spend uh, months preaching about those. They are uh, theologically rich. They teach us uh, great truths about Jesus Christ, and I'm sure I will get to that um, some other time. But we're just going to give a brief um, summarizing of these first several verses. But it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And this passage parallels Genesis chapter 1 on purpose, right? If you remember Genesis chapter 1, do you remember how it starts? In the beginning was who? Was God, right? And so God, and what was the first thing that God did? He said, well, and of all of his creative purposes, God said, let there be light. You know what? There was light. That's what God's word says. And so, uh, not the literal light, but God is saying that Jesus in the beginning was God, who is Jesus Christ, and he was the light, and the light was good. That God is the source of light and life, and Christ is the source of light and life. That he was in the beginning, and all things were made through him, and all things Without, or not made with, without him, without nothing was made, nothing was made that was not made by him. This is the self-existent Christ, that there has never been a time when Jesus Christ did not exist, that he is eternal, and so is God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, that they are uh, the uh, heavenly being. Every other um, uh, being or a human being in uh, creation is uh, a person that is becoming in one sense or another. So Christ, uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are the only ones that, have, that are not becoming anything else. They are the true beings. Um, Christ does not grow because he cannot grow. He cannot mature or, or, or grow uh, smarter or, or wiser or kinder. Uh, he is at, at full capacity. And so God is the only being that is truly what we could say a being. Every one of us is becoming. We're becoming wiser. We're becoming older. In some cases, we're becoming crankier. And uh, we're always changing throughout our lives, and we will change and from these mortal bodies, and we'll have glorified bodies someday in the future. But only God is eternal. So light versus darkness is a common theme throughout Scripture, and it's extremely common in John. You'll see this um, over and over. John uses the word light and life. John uh, compares light and darkness over and over in this gospel and the other letters that he has written. So scripturally speaking, intellectually, light refers to truth. Light refers to holiness. Light refers to life. Biblically speaking, darkness refers to falsehood. And darkness refers to sin. And darkness refers to death. C.S. Lewis writes, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. And the gospel has illuminated our mind to the truth that God wants us to know about him and this world, this reality. We learn from God's word that Satan's kingdom is a kingdom of darkness. It's a domain of darkness darkness. Colossians 1.13 says this, that he, talking about Jesus, has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, that Satan rules a kingdom that is dark. The main characteristic of Satan's kingdom is moral and spiritual darkness now if you go deep enough in the oceans you will get it so deep in the water that light cannot penetrate it's hard to 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 grasp that but there are creatures that are on the bottom of the 
ocean and they have adapted to life in the darkness and so much so that some of them can't even see they don't it's 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 not a necessity there because there is no light and so they've adapted to their surroundings so that they can interact and so they can survive they've adapted to the darkness there's they're creatures of darkness and scripture says in a very real sense that that people in satan's kingdom they've adapted themselves to the darkness maybe that's the lifestyle they grew up in that's the the culture they were raised around uh maybe that was uh, the, the 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 lifestyle that they chose but they have adapted to darkness it's a domain of darkness this domain this kingdom is ruled by lies deception and guilt and it always 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 results in pain if you ever watch the news and i encourage you to do that sparingly like i've done before right and sometimes you'll see something and you'll see evil actions done by a person or a vote that is completely beyond any sort of comprehension, or actions done by a group of people or individuals, and you go, there is no logical, rational explanation for this. This makes absolutely no sense. And understand, it does make sense, if you understand that there is a domain, there is a kingdom of darkness. And Satan and his minions are ruling that darkness, and he wants that darkness to infect all people's hearts. It says, believers, we are called out of darkness to retrieve those still in the darkness. Are you listening to me, church? We are called out of darkness to retrieve those still in darkness. God didn't just save you from the darkness, from the dark domain of evil, lies, deceit, and pain, so then you can live on uh, your perfect, happy uh, life. No, that's not why God has exclusively done that. He's brought you so that you could bring other people out of this moral and spiritual darkness. This was long foretold that this would be the role that Jesus would play and that he would place on on his church. In Isaiah chapter 42, verses 6 through 7, written hundreds of years before the Christ came to this world, he said, I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and I will keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people. Listen to this, church. A light for the nations to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. That's what God says our role is. He said, long foretold the Messiah would come and he would be a light to the nations and he would bring people from moral darkness, those who were in in, in, in moral and spiritual chains and he would free them. And God would set up the church to help people from darkness. And one of my favorite kids' books that I like to, to read and read to my kids are the Chronicles of Narnia, and I've referenced that to you be, be, before. And one of them is called The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And in this particular story, a, a, a king sent out his lords into all the lands of Narnia so that he could find the ends of the world. And this one particular lord goes, but he goes missing, and nobody knows where he is at. And so then the heroes of the story long after go looking for him. And they find, they hear rumor of this, this island that he's potentially on. And it is called the Dark Island. But it has this reputation that sounds good. It says that all of your dreams will come true on this Dark Island. Sounds pretty good, all your dreams to come true true and so they uh, the heroes of the story come to this dark island and it's surrounded by this perpetual uh, misty darkness that you cannot see through but they steal themselves and they get the courage to go into the darkness to look for this friend of theirs this this lord and they end up finding him in the darkness Um, uh, almost on the brink of insanity uh, on the brink of suicide, he, uh, he is in a bad spot, and so they uh, begin to try to get him out of there, but he tells them this is the truth of the island. It's, it's not simply a, an island that makes your dreams come true, it's an island that makes your nightmares come true. 
And so he has been trapped in this spirit, this, this, this island, this, this darkness all by himself with no way out. And so then the, the people, the heroes, they begin to be frantic and afraid and they've been trying to leave this island but they can't seem to leave it themselves and the, and the fear and the horror of this darkness begins to weigh on them. And then one of the heroes prays for Aslan's help. And in that story, Aslan is, is the Christ figure. He is Christ in Narnia. And a light comes and pierces the darkness and this seabird leads them out and saves than from this living nightmare. Friends, there are a lot of people that have followed down a path that they were sure would make their dreams come true, and it turned out to be a nightmare. They believe this relationship would, 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 would bring them satisfaction and, and happiness to their souls and their hearts, and it ends up being a complete and utter nightmare. People begin down this career path and they're they're trying to please people and it seems good at first and it becomes an absolute nightmare. There's people that begin uh, with a substance that seem to bring joy and friends and it's become an absolute nightmare. It's our responsibility as believers to help bring people from the darkness. See friends, you don't have to be the light. In a very real sense, we cannot be the light, but all you have to do is be filled with the light that is Christ Jesus. And so you, you don't have to manufacture your own light. All you have to do is be filled with the light, the unfailing light of Christ Jesus, and we can bring people from this moral darkness into the light. Amen, church? See, light entered the darkness. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. He is the source of all goodness, all hope, all light. Look at point number two with me. We see that the light cannot be stopped. Look at the latter part here of verse five. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. See, this light cannot be Stop. We see that in point number two. So point number one, the light entered the darkness. And point number two, this light cannot be stopped. See, Christmas is a celebration of Christ's declaration of war. Now, we don't really say that uh, in our Christmas music most of the time, and we don't put that in, uh, we don't put, you know, bows and arrows and light them up on our, in our windows during Christmas, but it was a declaration of war against spiritual darkness. This is a rescue mission that Christ began 2,000 years ago to reclaim his people. And this is an unconventional war with unconventional warriors. We don't fight for land or for resources, but we fight for the souls of men. We we, We see in this passage that Satan and his subjects will resist the light. But they're not going to take this Sitting down. See, spiritual darkness comes in many forms. It can come in, uh, with, with drugs and alcohol abuse. It can become with wrong sexuality. It can come with uh, different world religions that don't know the truth. And friends, I've been to a lot of different places. I've been to mosques. I've been to Buddhist temples. I've been to Sikh houses of worship. I've been to Mormon churches. And spiritual darkness is still spiritual darkness. Despite people's sincerity and their moral attempts at goodness, spiritual darkness is still spiritual darkness. And I I know that's not a politically correct thing to say, and I could care less about this, but this is what the Bible says. As the people, no matter their sincerity, uh, no matter their their, their desire to to, to do right by their, their system, if it's not what the Bible says is true, then it's not right. It's wrong. It pulls people away from the light instead of them bringing them closer to their true God. See, all the forces of Satan been trying to prevent life and extinguish the light, but they could not. The darkness could not overcome it, it says in this passage. The darkness has always tried to overcome the light, but has been unable to do so. If you've got your Bibles, look with me at just the next couple chapters over in in John chapter 3, verses 19 through 21. 
talks about the light. Now we know John 3.16 very well, but there's a lot of other verses after that that are extremely significant. Read along in verse 19. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, talking about Jesus, and the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. The Bible gives the answer and the solution to all of life's problems. The reason racism, murder, hate, hate, riots, lust exist in this world is because of this answer. Because what it says in John chapter 3, because man loves darkness more than light. That's the answer. Are you with me, church? Now you watch the news, which you should do what? Sparingly, church, right? I've been through this. And they got a lot of answers. The, 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 the problem of humanity, people with any uh, eyes all to see can see that there is a, something deeply wrong with the hearts of men. It doesn't matter at what country or what island that there's always been jealousy and strife and pride and anger and, and violence has always existed throughout humanity. So people can see that there is something wrong, but they come up with solutions uh, that, that, that will not help because if it's apart from Christ Jesus because man loves darkness more than he loves light are you with me church that's the problem in this world and so the only solution to this moral darkness is Christ Jesus and the church that Christ birthed there is no other solution there's a lot of dangers with darkness first of all you can be deceived by darkness yourself and believe uh, false things that are not true about yourself about God about this world you can believe those things that's a danger you can be dismayed by the darkness there's a lot of people that watch the news and you should do that sparingly and they look at our world and they get dismayed by the darkness. And they say, I can't believe people would do this. I can't believe people would act this way. I can't believe people would make these decisions. And, and they get dismayed by the darkness. And fear, like we talked about for the last several weeks, begins to own their hearts, begins to control their hearts. And they are dismayed by the dark. And believers can be dismayed by the dark. But here's one of the, well, maybe one of the more dangerous things about the darkness is it can dull you. It can bring spiritual dullness to your life. You know, just my house, just like anybody else's house, got, has lots of lights. And it seems like every fixture I have has 15 lights on it. And uh, as a husband, I know it's my responsibility to change the lights, but I don't always get around to it like I should. And, and you know, you'll go into your closet or you'll go into your, your, your bathroom and it's got 10 lights and only one of them is out. And I say, okay, well, I can get to that some other time. And then another light goes out and another light goes out. And, and you know, after a while, you know, you're trying to shave, but you can't quite see in the in the darkness and then you and then you go and buy some lights and you go wow I can really I can see this is so much better I can I can see what I'm dressing myself in and and I need all the help I can get with it turn on the lights it's not that I choose darkness I just get used to it after a while right you look around our world look what they play on the TVs you look playing the movies. Look at how your coworkers talk. See the news. You get used to darkness. You get used to people treating people this way. You get used to people talking this way. You get used to people acting wrong and living in darkness. If you're not careful, you'll have a, a dullness to that. And it won't affect you anymore. 
And friends, don't be surprised when evil people do evil things. People in the news are always surprised about how this evil person did an evil thing. Well, the Bible's not surprised about it. God's not surprised about it. You shouldn't be surprised when evil people do evil things. But you can be grieved by it. You can be moved by it. You can pray and fight against moral darkness. But do not be surprised about darkness in our world. So Satan and his subjects will resist the light. They always have and they always will. But look at the last principle we can gain from this. See, Christ, the light, will be victorious in spite of this opposition. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. The darkness has always tried to overcome it, but the darkness cannot overcome Christ and his people. In Genesis 3.15, it's Jesus, or, or, or God was talking to, uh, to um, the, the snake here, and it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring, and he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. With the very first people's darkness came into our world, and sin seeped into the heart of humanity, and it was uh, Satan from the beginning has been trying to bring darkness into the heart of people and so he did and he succeeded and he brought sin into this world and man accepted that that burden and when he did then God spoke to Satan and he said there will always be enmity between God's people and your people Satan there will always be enmity between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light but that one day there's coming there's coming somebody from the woman's seed named Christ Jesus who will bruise who will be bruised but he will crush the serpent's head and so Satan has been fighting a defeated battle ever since. See, Christ delivered the death blow to the snake at the cross. Understand this, person, believer, unbeliever, seeker. Understand this this morning, that God is not indifferent to your pain. He's not indifferent to the pain and sorrow and struggle of this world. If he was, he wouldn't have sent Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ wouldn't have come and bore all of our pain, bore all of our sorrow, bore all of our sin. The Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin for us. That we could become the righteousness of God. And Satan is a defeated foe. Now he is still a harmful foe. And Christ will deal with him completely one day that the death blow has been delivered at the cross and evil has always tried to snuff out the true church through persecution it began in Jerusalem it began uh, after that in Rome it's continued in Asia and and, and absolutely brutal persecution and even to this day in places in in Asia and and particularly in the Middle East and places in Africa there is absolutely brutal persecution of the church That's why we need to pray for our missionaries. That's why some of them, if you saw, their faces were darkened because we're not allowed to tell people where they go because those places are so dangerous, they could be killed for it. We need to pray for those missionaries. We will fight against the darkness. The darkness has always tried to come against the church. It's been coming against the church for thousands of years and the church still stands. It's taken blow after blow from Satan but it will not quit. One of my, uh, the, the, one of the, the, the best boxers sort of arguably in history was Muhammad Ali and he had a, a, a technique called the rope and dope. You all know what the rope and dope is? And, and uh, what he would do is, is he would get himself backed up into the corner. And he'd get himself backed up into the ropes of a boxing ring. And he would, uh, with, his, with his skill that only uh, certain boxers can have, he would let his opponent just wail on him. And he would let every one of those punches push him back into the ropes. And so he was uh, absorbing the blows, but he was never taking any crucial hits. He just kept taking the blows and taking the blows and taking the blows until you finally wear out your opponent and then you just punch him right in the nose and that's the end of it. But, uh, and so he, would, he took all the blows but was still standing. And the church has been taking blow after blow after blow for 2,000 years. God's people are still standing. And friend, you need to hear this today. You may get some body blows here before too long to this church in America, but we will continue to stand. Christ's church cannot be overcome. The light does not overcome the darkness. Friends, we fight against the darkness within, 
as we do without. That there is plenty of moral darkness in my own heart and I must fight and I must stand against that if I want to have any impact on the darkness outside of my heart. So we fight both of those. We fight the moral darkness that creeps into our hearts all the time and we fight against the darkness in this world. We let the light expose, expose sin and darkness in your life. And I know, I know, I know that there are people in this church that have overcome suicide. They've overcome drugs. They've overcome addiction. They've overcome depression. And they're still standing. And so you keep fighting. I don't know what moral darkness you're wrestling with. You know. And God knows. With his power living in you, his light in your heart, you can defeat that darkness. Friend, I want you to know that you, you shine. We fight in a different way. We don't fight the way the world fights. We shine, we fight by being a person of integrity. You be a person of integrity at your work. When all the other employees do this, that this is this is this is the way that we'll we'll treat our customers. This is how we'll get an extra, this is how we'll get ahead, this is how we'll make an extra buck, this is how everybody else talks. And you be a person of integrity, and you'll shine your light. You be a person of purity, a particularly young person. When all of the other friends are sleeping around and says that that's okay, and the Bible says it's wrong, the only time it's ever allowed that you're allowed to have sexual relations is in marriage. Everything else is wrong. And there's like, but all of your friends and most young people are are are, are doing that. I'm telling you, you want to shine. You want to shine. You live a pure life. Be a thoughtful person to your neighbor. Maybe he's too old to, to, or she's too elderly to, to, to do something at her house, in her yard. You shine the light. Speak truth when you really, really don't want to. You speak truth when it's really, really hard, but you need to. That's how you can shine the light. You shine the light by inviting people to church, by sharing the gospel. Um, I don't know if I have it with me. We got all these out here in the foyer. We'll be passing them out at the end. These are our candlelight Christmas Eve service. We'll be passing these out here um, at the end of the service. Same time we always do it, 5:30, the 24th, which is you know Christmas Eve. Hand it to a cashier. You hand it to your friend. You hand it to a customer. You got enough nerve? And you say, "I'd like you to come to my church Christmas Eve." And I promise you, I'll share the gospel that night. I'll be brief, quick, but I'll share the gospel. You invite your friends. You invite your family. You invite coworkers. You invite strangers. You invite your neighbors. I'll do my part. You do your part. God will do his part. Let's shine the light. Friends, Christmas is a wonderful time of the year. I love celebrating. I love celebrating that Christ, the Christ man, the God man, came into the cavern, the cave of my own dark heart and spread light, and spread joy. That's what I want to remember during Christmas. So friends, Christ is our hope for this darkness in our world, in our own hearts.